Romans 12 and verse 3 says that God has given to every person the measure of faith. In other words, God has given faith as a gift to everyone. And when you draw on that faith from God, you call on the name of the Lord in repentance, you will be saved. The Bible says that. Welcome to the Worship Center in Bryan's Road, Maryland, where Jesus is saving lives, saving souls, and saving futures. Now here's Dr. Steve Davis with wisdom tips, life treats, and gold nuggets from God's Word. We're talking about being lights shining in the darkness of this world and how just a little light can penetrate the darkness in a person's life. And you know, that light isn't something that you produce in and from yourself. It's not about a bright, shiny personality. It's the light of the Lord that shines through you as a born-again, spirit-filled child of God. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. And that faith doesn't originate with us. It's the gift of God. So no one can brag or boast or think they're better than anybody else because salvation is the free gift from God. And without faith, no one can be saved. And fortunately, Romans 12 and verse 3 says that God has given to every person the measure of faith. In other words, God has given faith as a gift to everyone. And when you draw on that faith from God, you call on the name of the Lord in repentance, you will be saved. The Bible says that. And once you come to know the Lord, though, it's not long before you realize that you need to grow, that God is drawing you to himself so that you can know him better. The spirit of God on the inside of you begins to work powerfully in your spirit, and he works in you day and night, bringing changes, maturing and growing you. And there are seven areas that God wants to have added in your life alongside of your faith that will cause the light of God, the character, the nature of God to be revealed in your life and will touch the lives of other people. Second Peter chapter one, verses five through seven talks about them and reveals what God is wanting to do in your heart and your life. You have faith. That's how you got saved, acting on that faith, calling upon the name of the Lord. But then There's more that the Spirit of God is wanting to release into your life. Number one is what the Bible calls virtue. Verse 5 says, add to your faith virtue. Virtue, on a common definition, means it's a lifestyle of high moral standards. It has to do with morality, being ethical, having integrity, being honest, being able to be trusted, things like that. And we're in a culture that's not moral, It's not moral. It's unethical. It's filled with people who lack integrity, who are dishonest. People are disloyal and untrustworthy. God is working in us to shine as lights in the darkness and to make a difference in the lives of those who know him and in the lives of those who don't. And having faith is what opens the door for the Holy Spirit to work these other virtues into your life. A lot of people have on some level come to the Lord. They want to go to heaven. But Jesus wants to be Lord of all of our lives, not just one time a week on Sundays when we go to a church service or watch a broadcast or a video or whatever. God wants to work through us. He has a way for us to live and how our relationships should go and how we conduct ourselves in our day-to-day lives. Your day-to-day life and my day-to-day life matter to him. It's our day-to-day lives that speak to people. Our day-to-day lives are where our testimonies are lived out. And that's one of the reasons the Holy Spirit wants to keep working in our lives day by day. Virtue overcomes the sin in our lives because even if your flesh enjoys a particular sin or any sin, virtue is contrary to sin and the presence of God's virtue in our life highlights the ugliness of the sin that sometimes we're so drawn to. And that's part of what God is talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 13 where he says, through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. God doesn't intend for you to struggle and struggle and struggle with trying to overcome sin. The Holy Spirit himself will break the power of that sin off of you as you yield to him. And that virtue, the honesty, the integrity, the being committed to letting the Lord have his way in your life will cause you to move ahead in the things of God. Number two is knowledge. Still there in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, it says, they're about adding to your faith, it says knowledge. 
God expresses over and over how he wants us to grow in knowledge and to not be ignorant of spiritual and biblical truths. God wants us to know his will and to know his word and to know how to walk out the life that he has planned for us and wants to work through us. And we need to know the word of God so we can know his will. The only way to know the will of God is to know the word of God. And we need to know what God wants. We need to know how to respond. It also takes knowledge to overcome the enemy. And that comes through the knowledge of how the enemy operates. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says that we are not ignorant of the devil's devices, his schemes, his plans, or how he operates, his devices. You can't overcome by faith if you don't have the knowledge of where to apply your faith or how to walk in faith or even what to say in faith. If a person doesn't know the word of God, they're going to be easily tempted and readily led astray. False doctrines are abundant out there, and false teachers and untruths are filling people's minds. Our calling is to live out the truth, the truth of the Bible, to speak the truth, to demonstrate the truth. So, People can have the knowledge that sets them free. Jesus said in John 8, verse 32, that you shall know, that's knowledge, the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Number three is self-control. He says in 2 Peter chapter 1, in verse 6 there, for us to add to our faith, self-control. You know, we can have faith and we can have virtue, we can have knowledge, but if we don't have any impulse control, we're going to make a mess of our lives. Think about the messes people have gotten themselves into all because of a lack of self-control. Out of control spending, out of control eating, out of control sexual drives, out of control just desires in general. Anything can mess up a person's life. So many health problems can come from out of control appetites and habits that after a while, even the person engaging in them doesn't enjoy. If virtue and knowledge will help with self-control because they help us to set standards in our lives. They help us to set boundaries in our lives. Things we just won't do because we're a Christian. Things we won't say because we love Jesus. Areas where we set limits, we don't push those limits. Renewing our minds to the Word of God will help reveal those limits and those boundaries. Because you can spend years doing the right thing and yielding to the Spirit of God. Many people do, and then in even just a weekend or less, undo it all and bring shame and humiliation to yourself. That can happen. Plus, it makes such a bad impact on the people around you that you know the Lord wants to help you keep your life and your heart under his lordship and his leadership, self-control. Too many people have been put off by the sins and inconsistencies of Christians. They know enough to expect a difference on our lives, and that difference is revealed when we are not out of control, but we're under the Holy Spirit's control. That's what's so important under his control. And then there's number four, patience. 2 Peter 1 verse 6 says that adding to our faith, we need to add patience. We need to know that God loves us. His timing is perfect. And sometimes, many times, he has a different timeline, a different schedule than we do. And we need to persevere to not give up when things are not happening as quickly as we wish they would. I mean, patience is a major thing. We need to be patient with God when it seems like he's dragging his feet in responding to our prayers. We need to be patient with other people who are acting or doing as we think they shouldn't be doing, you know, or not responding like they should. We need to be patient with our family, with our loved ones, our Christian brothers and sisters. Be patient with your pastor. Be patient with your leaders. Having faith means we also need to have patience. We also need to be patient with ourselves. I know for me, sometimes when it takes so long to grow or to get better, I would lose patience with myself and just want to give up. Never doubt that the Lord is working in your life day and night, making you stronger and better every day, even when you don't realize it. In fact, the Bible says that it's through faith and patience that we inherit the promises of God. That's in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. If we're not patient, We'll just settle for the first thing or for the, or for the first person who comes along and we can end up with the wrong thing or in the wrong relationship. You know, if we're just going for the quick and easy answer, I can tell you that rarely is God's best for us. People have married the wrong person because they were lonely and desperate. 
People have settled for the wrong job. It was just available and they were broke, so they took it and they can't stand the job they have. Impatience can cause all kinds of problems and sorrow and even misery in a person's life. And that's why God wants to be sure that you get patience in addition to your faith. Number five, the fifth thing to add to your faith is godliness. That's also in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Godliness, how would God have us behave in all we do? That's how our testimony to other people gets stronger and more powerful and more effective. Godliness is a commitment to serving and pleasing God, being intentional about serving Him, being intentional about pleasing Him, doing everything for that audience of one. It's about aiming to please Him instead of pleasing ourselves. Romans 15 and verse 3 says that even Jesus didn't please himself so that he could please the one who sent him. And when the goal of our faith is to please the Father in all things, it gives us a focus and a power that can come in no other way and can make your life impactful in a way that nothing else can. Number six, here's a big one, one that a lot of religious people completely miss. They can have all the rest of them, but then there's brotherly kindness. That's in verse 7. A lot of people have religion and say they love God, but they seem to not really love anybody else. And they can come off as critical and fault-finding, hard-hearted, angry, bigoted, temperamental, moody, and really not at all pleasant to be around. In fact, even non-believers know that Christians ought to be caring and gentle and loving and not judgmental or critical of everybody else. And the way we treat people, the way we talk to people, the way we talk about people really does matter. We are the light of the world and are the shining lights of Jesus and the character of Jesus wherever we go. That's what we do. Jesus was not known for running around criticizing people and being hateful and putting people and institutions and all down and all of that. He wasn't selfish. When a person had fallen, he didn't stand there criticizing them or telling them that it served them right. He lifted them up. He let them know that their falling and failing would not keep them away from the love and the cleansing of God. You know, when the multitudes were hungry, You know, Jesus didn't yell at them for forgetting to pack their lunches. Hey, y'all, go ahead and be hungry. You didn't pack your lunch. And then turn around and take the little boy's lunch so he could eat it all by himself. No, he displayed what we know as brotherly kindness, giving thanks for that food. He knew how it felt to be hungry, to be hurting, and to be in need. And he multiplied that food and took care of the needs of everyone. And as his followers, we demonstrate that too, caring for other people. One of the best ways your light can shine in the darkness is through brotherly kindness, treating people as people and not as labels, not as enemies, not as less than you. Showing brotherly kindness is a major way that you can shine the light of Jesus into this world. And then number seven, love. You add the other six qualities to your faith, then there's the greatest one, which is love. The Bible says the greatest of these is love. And God tells us that love is what activates your faith. Galatians 5 and verse 6 says that faith works by love. Your faith won't work without love as the motivator and the carrier of it. And love is active. Where brotherly kindness many times is reactive, seeing somebody with a need, love is active. Reactive means you might see somebody needing help and then you try to help them. Or a person that's hungry and then feed them like Jesus did for the multitudes. But love is active. That means that love seeks to help people. It looks for the opportunity to make a difference in someone's life, to ease the pain, to meet a need. Love helps you to be patient, to be kind, to not be easily offended. Love drives you to believe the best about God and the best about people, the best about situations. It keeps you hopeful. It's love that causes you to reach out to someone who may be in need, even if you don't really care about them or like them in the natural, but you know there's a need and you love them in the Lord. And you may need to text them and and ask them how they're doing, call them. Love calls you to pull alongside someone who may need help. They may need encouragement. And it helps you to work with them at their own speed, believing you're making a difference and that the Lord is working in their situations for his glory. That's what love does when coupled with faith. Like I said, it's not just because you like them or you have a lot in common. It's because you love them. And those seven things added to your faith intensify the light of God shining into the darkness around you. It's what not only gives you vision, but it helps you to act on that vision. The inventor of the light bulb, Thomas Edison, said that 
Vision, unless acted on, is a hallucination. Faith without works is dead. The light that you shine will pierce the darkness in you and around you. And that's why way down there in verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 1 says, If anyone lacks these things, they're blind. And I believe that the Spirit of God will quicken these words in your spirit and will cause the light of God to shine brighter and brighter in you and through you for your good, for those around you, and for His glory. And I hope this message has blessed you. I hope it'll keep blessing you. I pray that you'll share this message with somebody that you believe it will encourage and bless. That's really important. Give us a thumbs up if it ministered to you. If you haven't subscribed already to be part of our online family, don't forget to subscribe. And then hit that little bell so you get notifications when we put a video up. Know that we pray for you and everyone on our list, everyone on the online list of subscribers. And please pray for me. I always need it and I totally appreciate it. Thank you and God bless. We hope you were blessed, inspired, and challenged by what you heard today. And we pray that God spoke some inspired truths into your heart. This ministry is supported by your gifts and donations. If you'd like to help us spread the good news, you can give at our website, www.theworshipcenter.org. Or you can text to give at 301-637-0777. It's easy and takes only seconds to set up. Thank you for listening and God bless you and your family.